both of whom um, I've been following for 20 years or something or more, and like totally depend on you both for your analysis and knowledge of trade agreements and, and food issues. So it's it's really exciting to have this very brief moment together to do a workshop. Well, thank you. So can everyone hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, so I'm Karen Hansen Kuhn. I'm program director at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, and I have we work to ensure fair and sustainable food farm and trade systems. We have, are, we're headquartered in Minneapolis. I work in the D.C. office. We have an office in Berlin as well. Um, and we formed uh, at a point when there was a farm crisis in the United States in the 1980s. And the founders, talking to pea farmers in other countries, came to make connections between this model of production that depended so much on exporting as much as possible that we started to look into, you know, what that means, what kind of rules we need. As the WTO got started, we had an office in Geneva where we uh, leaked information, sent out analysis, worked in coalition. This was before, I guess, well, anyway, uh, in any case, that work morphed into work on NAFTA and other trade agreements, and now we also do a lot of work, emerging work on climate change. and. And so I guess I'll stop there, just as an introduction for myself. Um, today, we want to start with two foundational concepts that maybe everybody already knows, the concepts of food sovereignty and agroecology. Um, does anyone have a definition for food for either of those that they'd like to offer? I'd like to ask uh, what the difference is between food security and food sovereignty. If you could later elaborate a little, sure. that would be important. And would you mind introducing yourself? Well, we I invite Emmanuel to be part of the workshop. Introduced like it yeah. two times already. <coughs> I think many of you were in the workshop, right? Mm -hmm. the Some were, though, if you could just really quickly. Well, I'm from Mexico. <coughs> I worked many years in the Mexican Action Network on Free Trade and alliance with what then was the Alliance for Responsible Trade in the U.S. And then I moved to Washington and I work now with the Institute for Policy Studies, which is, uh, I don't know how many of you know it, but it's one of the most progressive, or well, the older progressive think tank in Washington. Um, and I've been there for 12 years, uh, working with Sarah Anderson and John Cavana on the trade uh, program. Didn't hear the organization. Well, so the Global Economy Program, actually. Couldn't hear the name of the organization. It's called the Institute for Policy Studies, IPS. Institute for Policy Studies. Um, I got there thanks to Karen, because the first uh, time I was in Washington, I was an intern of Karen. Uh, the development gap, the development group for alternative policies, and she introduced me to IPS. So that's where I am. So you raise a good question of what's the difference between food security and food sovereignty. Does anybody want to speak to that? I know you're all, like many of you, know all about this, and that's <laughs> great input. Well, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'll just put something yeah, in. Yeah, great. I would think that food sovereignty would mean that you make your own decisions in your own country about what you're going to grow and eat, not be forced by a corporation to buy their patented seeds, use their pesticides, forced to grow genetically modified foods, or talked into it being told that it's going to save your culture and save the world, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So I would consider that like food sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's a really, that is the key element of food sovereignty, that aspect of democratic decision making. Food security, also an important concept, is about people having enough food that is appropriate and nutritious. So that, that's a great thing, but of course you could get that way, you could get food in a lot of different ways maybe without uh, considering the social context or the environmental context in a particular country. So food sovereignty is broader than that. It's, you know, this idea of democratic decision making over the food system that people decide they want. Another important element uh, is that it prioritizes food for local communities over production for export. So it doesn't say we shouldn't trade, but it says the priority should be feeding our communities. I'm going to keep losing that, but anyway. Um, so connected to that uh, is the concept of agroecology, um, which I think has been defined a few different ways. I, I always think of it as considering agriculture as part of the ecosystem. 
So it is bringing together often elements of traditional agriculture with modern science and encouraging a dialogue between farmers and scientists about what's appropriate. It focuses on things like strengthening the soil rather than ap applying chemicals. Um, and it is connected intimately to this idea of food sovereignty because it treats farmers you know, as actors in the system, as producers of knowledge, not just consumers of inputs. Um, so these two, these two uh, issues go hand in hand, and they are also, oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add to your agroecology, just that it's, it's a lot about rehabilitation of all the land that has been destroyed by corporate agriculture. The toxic load, the lack of organic material, I mean, it goes on and on about how our land has been degraded. And how our oceans have been degraded, just to always remember well, that our, we're talking about fisher peoples. I mean, climate disruption. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and I would add that it's much more, agroecology is much more than an environmental approach to agriculture. Of course, it is that, but it's also a movement. This is a, a pamphlet um, that Why Hunger put out about agroecology that we have several copies of that um, has a message from La Via Campesina, the international movement of peasants that defined food sovereignty in the, in the 90s. And one of the things it says is agroecology is not an alternative, but a way of life. It's one of the paths to end hunger and to transform society. And it has a little, like, we defend agroecology as building autonomy, it's peasant and indigenous seeds. There's a lot of points that I won't go over all of them, but it's communitarian with anti-capitalist values. So, yeah, both of those are key concepts that the global farmers movement, La Via Campesina, advances. Um, I spend, so I work in Washington, D.C., and I spend too much time looking at these trade agreements and trying to figure out what they mean. You know, and I always remember when we first saw investor state dispute settlement, none of us realized what that meant. You know, and I figure these guys are creative, they're always coming up with new ideas. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time looking at the details of these agreements and trying to figure that out. But I've been really inspired lately by the whole notion of the Green New Deal. You know, the idea that we don't just say, okay, we've got this system and how do we tweak it and what's the latest bad thing that they put in there? We say, let's step back. Let's think about what we want. And then we can get to, in this case, the trade rules we need or don't need to make it happen. The goal of trade agreements, free trade agreements, is to move goods and services and investment across border with as little friction as possible. And for the most part, they do that. But they don't do all of the other things we would want to see out of in economic interactions among our countries. And in fact, of course, they do a lot of harm. So here's where I would like us all to think big. Like just as we're all thinking big about what a Green New Deal means, what a just transition means, what do we want out of our food and farm system? Any ideas? Well, I want all organic farm, farming and regenerating the soil, and I, you know, I don't want any more any kind of chemicals whatsoever used, and I don't, I don't want them forcing seeds on us that are modified. And you know, I mean, I only want to eat organic food, and I want to know that what I eat is safe, and that it's safe for. Nature, mm -hmm. for bees and birds. The birds have all disappeared. I don't hear the birds anymore, you know. There's a hand in the back and then you. Uh, well, I want a lot. I want us to pay attention to water, first off. Uh, that's going to be the resource everybody is going to be clamoring over and fighting for in the future. And in, in saying that, uh, I want this state to subsidize the growing of hemp. Hemp takes half the water that cotton takes to grow. And we have large regions in the state that uh, would be good at, at that production. And uh, who knows how it should be processed. Should it be a co-op system of producing? Uh, I'm trying to work, I'm hoping to work with the Yakima Nation to uh, see that crop become <coughs> real. And you all could help by <coughs> finding out what other countries, Germany's doing that, Spain is after the reception, I think Spain stepped up, and you're starting to see advertisement for hemp clothing 
on Thank Facebook. Thank you. I just want to make sure that there's lots of people can yeah. have input, but <laughs> thanks for the beginning of a, or building on a vision that we started. Do you want to say something and then Chris? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's very important to uh, give some of our farmers the, their power back and, and allow them to do seed saving and, and, uh, and to make sure that they are getting a fair price for their goods so that they can have a decent living. But I also want to know what's in my food. Yeah. I want to know that I'm not, um, you know, I buy all our organic, but it's, but that comes at a price. Um, but I'm willing to pay that price. Yeah. But it, it's irritating to me because, you know, I, yeah, I don't want my environment degraded. I don't want... <laughs> Yeah. So, you talked about fair prices for farmers. I think that's really important. And again, just to remind us that <coughs> fisher folk need fishermen need fair prices too. Just yeah. Chris, and then I saw a hand over here. I'm interested in the large issue of inequality in our society. It's being discussed in the political realm these days. Bernie says there should be no billionaires. Elizabeth says well, has a big wealth tax. Um, <coughs> same thing in agriculture. I'm interested in a more equal distribution of land and of farm sales. They're extremely skewed and getting more skewed every decade. I want to see an agricultural system and um, production methods that will on net be a benefit to climate rather than a detriment to climate. Um, when agricultural practices end up making climate change worse, we know that things have gone very wrong. Yeah. I would like to see uh, use of soil to suck some to uh, sequester some of this carbon, mm -hmm. and uh, you know uh, change our policies so that the uh, agriculture actually does that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm more interested in trying to understand the long view on um, how people. What motivates people, how people feel about things, in terms of what, how we got here in the first place. My, my mom grew up on a dryland farm where she watered from a well, uh, cooked with a wood stove, and, and that's a you know, generation away, and, and most people farm with horses. Um, it happened really quickly, before, 100 years before that, people starved regularly. Um, so, and I, what I know is that people's motivations for, I mean, how we got to this place is that human motivation, and, and, it, and it happened, it was a lot of, it was actually an attempt to try to solve problems, um, which led to the technologies, etc. I mean, the first technology was the ox uh, plow, which uh, people, families could only farm, and then the ox plow allowed people to grow, to expand uh, farms big enough. That was the beginning of capitalism, actually. That was 5,000 years ago. We continue to do this process, human beings, we have motivations and drives that do this to change those things. Uh, I mean, the problem with billionaires is that for every billionaire, there's a million people who would want to be a billionaire. They'll, it's the system that people believe in and are motivated to are care. And, and it's crazy because you're not any happier with more money. Shift. There's not any, you don't get any happy about beyond a certain point, but we still have this drive. So, because I mean, the, if you can just wrap up, so lots of people can participate. Yeah. I just we got. I think to solve, to look at these, we got to think of how we got here, which took many many generations, and in order to say how do we turn around how people think about mm -hmm. it, and it's not going to be simple little. I'm sorry. I mean, I wear him too, but I'm not. It's not. That's not going to be the issue. The issue is what motivates people to do something. Because I, I mean, arguing in Bellingham about going taking away uh, gas, and I'm talking to a, f a friend who's really into the environment, but he really doesn't want to lose the capacity to get his water to heat really quickly. Yeah. Okay, thank <laughs> so, you. So. Did you have your hand up? Okay, did you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think tying into the, the comments about both information and, and carbon, labeling food with the carbon footprint of it, I think, mm. can allow us all mm. to make intelligent decisions about what you're I have a question for you. Have you both been doing research around uh, what's working and what's not in, in agriculture in America? Free trade? Yes, we'll be talking about that in just a minute. Did you? I'm not sure where we are on time. 
interesting. Um, I think we're actually pretty good. It's only 20 so, after 5. Yeah. I'm just wondering how many more comments should we take? Maybe we have like two more minutes okay. for comments. So if someone, is there anybody who wants to um, make a comment who hasn't spoken already? Especially encourage people who aren't white men just to <laughs> for, put, you know, really? make sure that we have, I, white men may speak. Just that's something we're trying to do more is just make sure that women and people of color can take the space as well. It's okay. Okay, go ahead. Just two things I know locally. Snohomish County Conservation District is making a big push right now. They just had their opening night of it to preserve farmland because we're losing it at an incredible rate. And the second thing is that uh, Skagit County is extremely strong with making food hubs so that people can actually concentrate the amount of produce they're growing and have some industrial accounts. So it's a really big change. Yeah. yeah. Ed, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was wondering if you guys would comment on what they were talking about in the last session here is that, you know, there is all these trade agreements. It's not just the WTO. There's a gazillion of them. And, uh, you know, they all have the investor, you know, where the, the court, three so-called courts and everything. But, you know, if we passed a new, a Green New Deal here, just about every bit of it would be trade illegal. Mm -hmm. And the people don't think about that. You know, we're just thinking about our country. But, you know, uh, it's, they were talking about how India tried to, you know, uh, subsidize, you know, help local uh, solar, uh, solar yeah. right? And then yeah. they, they were sued. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's outrageous. what's happening here in Washington, why Inslee doesn't want to do that. Yep. I, did, I didn't try, but, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of what we're trying to ask is, like, step outside of like outside of this current system and think about what what do we want so that we can articulate that because all of that is so incredibly the power balance is so in favor of corporations we're talking about other countries and i think it was uh because of the wto uh monsanto went into india and many farmers in india ended up losing their farms yeah, well, the, the closest country we have is Mexico to see the impacts of uh, the free trade agreements yes. of NAFTA, right? Mm -hmm. And we were in a workshop, Karen and I, the other day in Mexico City, and people came up with also, uh, you know, ideas about the importance of education in schools, about the relation between consumption, uh, you know, nourishment and health. And it's very urgent that, particularly in Mexico, but also, of course, in the U.S., the children learn about, you know, what they did. Because the rates of obesity, as I have documented, have grown exponentially in Mexico after and after. We have to figure out a way to break down these corporations. <laughs> yeah, we do. So, I think these are all things, all the things I would raise as well. I really appreciate it that someone mentioned fair prices for farmers in all of this, because often what we hear, people want things to be better, they want better environmental conditions, but they're not thinking about the fact that uh, farmers are going broke. There is a crisis in rural America um, that is in large part because of low prices, which we're going to get into. But we're going to start shifting through the connection to trade. So these are the things we want. This is a video La Via Campesina did <laughs> anyway, that I think is a nice framing to kind of open up. Excuse me. Five reasons why La Via Campesina thinks WTO is bad for agriculture. One, it has increased inequality and rural debt by destroying local peasant markets. The World Trade Organization, WTO, has created a free trade system that gives huge agribusiness corporations receiving massive subsidies the freedom to dump cheap food into economically weaker nations. This has pushed peasants to the margins, caused a crash in price, destroyed local peasant markets, and has increased rural debt, all the while aiding the concentration of wealth. 
The result? A criminal level of inequality where 82% of the world's wealth is now in the hands of a mere 1%. 2. A handful of corporations now control the global food system. Less than 20 global corporations today control the global food chain that governs what food we buy and how we buy it. The three largest corporations control more than 50% of the world's seed market. The top four corporations control 99% of livestock breeding. Ten corporations enjoy 55% of the fertilizer market. Four traders control around 75% of the world's grain and soya market. A mere 11 corporations control 30% of food processing. It's all about consolidation and control now. 3. Free Trade Agreements criminalizes a 10,000-year-old food system by patenting seeds and giving corporations the upper hand. Seed is the basis of life. The WTO and other free trade agreements force, sometimes threaten countries to sign seed treaties that allow corporations to put patents on seeds. Today, this has led to peasants being treated as criminals for selecting and reusing seeds from their own harvest. Peasants feed the world. We are not criminals. Even when some governments resist, these free trade systems allow investors to sue national governments in international court, overriding national laws and democratic processes. 4. Industrial agriculture is heating up our planet. Industrial agriculture and related land use contributes to 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions. It has led to extreme weather fluctuations affecting agriculture and peasants the most. 5. WTO and free trade agreements kills peasants. On the 10th of September 2003, in Cancun, Mexico, Lee Kyung Hae, the Korean peasant, took his own life outside the WTO meeting venue to expose the destruction WTO has caused in rural areas. He was a brilliant farmer who turned a barren land into a thriving farm. Yet he lost everything after Korea started importing cheap rice and cows. Lee is not the only one. In India alone, over 300,000 peasants took their lives in the last 20 years, unable to bear their mounting debt. It is now a worldwide phenomenon. In Lee's memory, we mark 10th of September as the Global Day of Action against WTO and Free Trade Agreements. We are all Lee. WTO kills peasants everywhere. Keep agriculture out of free trade negotiations. We want food sovereignty, not free trade. So, and I think this is a really powerful statement. I will say, I struggle a little bit with it. Should agriculture be out altogether, or should the rules be different? And I think it's not, to me it's not entirely clear, but I think the points they raise are right on, are exactly right. And I just want to add a little bit of information um, to what they talked about there before we open back up for discussion. One is talking about that first point, about dumping of goods on poor countries and what the impacts are. So my organization has documented the extent of dumping, that is, exporting it below the cost of production for 20-some years now. <coughs> and what we do is we add up all, anyways, when, so this is for corn, wheat, soybean, rice, and cotton. Those are the crops that get the vast majority of subsidies under our farm bill. Um, the farm bill is designed with the intention that those crops benefit, that farmers should, and they've said this explicitly, get big or get out, and that when prices drop, they should be depending on export markets, producing more to make up in volume what they're losing in low prices. 
So this is a system that is bad for farmers here too and leads to this overproduction. Now I do disagree with La Via Campesina that subsidies are the problem. I think subsidies are the symptom. They are one element of the problem, but our whole farms program is geared towards attention on those five crops um, and, and supporting big production. So you can see, it's a little bit blurry, but everywhere, so here's zero. And this is starting in 1990. All of the years where it's above zero, and you can see it gets up to 60% for some crops, that we were exporting those crops at that much below the cost of production, effectively. Um, there's a couple of blips. They have, we had a food price crisis right in here. Food prices rose really high. Uh, and again, then there was a drought around 2011, 2012. And then prices dropped again, and we see the trend resuming. So during the NAFTA years, corn, for example, since NAFTA began, at one point was exported at 33% below the cost of production. So that production goes to Mexico. It drives farmers there out of business. It's been documented that something like 5 million farmers were either compelled to become contract workers, that's 2.9 million, or even out of agriculture altogether because they could not compete with this low-cost goods. Now, that is a lot of that is the farm bill. But the trade agreements say you can't keep, you can't make any barriers to that trade. So under NAFTA, uh, Mexico lowered all of its tariffs on corn and other crops. They actually did it faster than they had to, but in any case, they gave up the ability to protect local production. So that's where the connection uh, to the trade agreements comes in. Um, so this is, to me, dumping it, it sort of, illustrates a lot of these connections um, and starts to take us in a different direction. I would say that beyond this problem, which is pervasive and cuts across all different trade agreements, there are a few things specific to the new NAFTA that we should also be thinking about. Um, when, those agree when that agreement started, the idea was you were going to have something different, right? That it was going to help farmers and workers and I don't know, maybe it'll do something for workers on labor rights, but it's not going to do anything at all for farmers. Um, a lot of farm groups made <coughs> the demand that they include country of origin labeling for meat. That was something that was challenged under WTO rules by Mexico and Canada. So we suggested that they ask Canada and Mexico to withdraw that complaint. Uh, that was ignored. It didn't go anywhere. Um, when we look at this problem of dumping, you know, it is a problem both of low prices and overproduction. And we have a really good example to our north of how to do things differently. Canada has a really great supply management program for dairy. In the U.S., we have dairy farmers going out of business left and right. There will probably be very few small farmers left in the next five years. There, they balance, they do... A, careful calculation every month, they balance supply and demand, so farmers can get a certain price up to, up to a certain volume of production. If they make more than that, that's their problem. So mostly farmers don't. They make, they make less of it, farm, so farmers stay on the land, consumers don't pay outrageous prices, but it doesn't work if you have a lot of cheap milk coming in from the U.S. So initially that was one of Trump's demand, that they completely open up the Canadian market. Uh, which would not have solved anything. Um, Canada's whole dairy market is the size of Wisconsin's dairy production. Uh, so it wouldn't have made any difference, but it does give us something we could be looking to. Maybe it wouldn't be exactly the same thing here, uh, but there are ways we can think about, um, you know, balancing supply and demand, paying fair prices to farmers by producing less and not depending on exporting to solve all the problems. Now, under NAFTA, uh, the dairy market in Canada gets opened up 3.6%, which is better than eliminating it, under which is what they were going to do. Right? What's that? Under NAFTA 2.0? Under the new NAFTA. Yeah. yeah, it was totally excluded under the original NAFTA. Mm -hmm. I think their tariffs are something like 280%, so it doesn't really go in very much, with some exceptions. But the opening that happens under the new NAFTA is now on top of openings that happened under the Trans-Pacific Partnership 
under the agreement yeah. between Canada and Europe, so the market starts to be opened up, the system starts to be eroded. Yeah. Um, so to us, this is a problem. It's a trade connection. You know, we should allow countries to erect those kind of barriers when it makes sense. And in fact, having variable tariffs has been a demand at the WTO for 15 years now. Um, many developing countries have advocated for something called a special safeguard mechanism that would say uh, when prices drop, countries could institute a temporary tariff to bring prices right, right back up or exclude certain key goods uh, from trade liberalization. That proposal, there's a lot of technical support behind that, uh, and it has been dead for at least 10 years now. Um, but there's still, I mean, in terms of negotiations, that's what I'm saying. <coughs> a lot of ideas about how things could be done differently. Um, what else was I going to say? So I think that, you know, the idea of having more information about our food is also important. Under the new NAFTA, um, there are new restrictions on food labeling, particularly uh, proprietary ingredients in junk food uh, can be hidden as a business secret. Uh, the science used in judging pesticides and other chemicals can also be kept away from the public eye uh, as confidential business information. So we have less information about the standards. Um, as well as not getting the country of origin labeling that we wanted. NAFTA also for the first time includes a special provision on agricultural biotechnology, urging countries to lower barriers and it has some different provisions about how that could happen so that other countries would get to the same standards that we have. Um, so as I said, I, I think it may be the labor rights provisions in NAFTA do something. It doesn't do anything for farmers. And it's not done yet. I mean, this thing really might not go through. Um, but so I think, you know, if we think about pulling back again to what we want, what the current problems are, some of which are taking away government's power to institute tariffs, to protect certain things, um, and giving corporations more power to hide information or to challenge things. Then we can come back to this question La Via Campesina raises. Should there be rules on, a, on tr agriculture at all in trade agreements? I don't know the answer to that. Um, it's something I struggle with. But I thought perhaps that would be a place to open back up for discussion. Or if you have any questions about the stuff I just blew through. Well, I have. Can I hand up first and then Chris? Yeah. <clears throat> so maybe I could come back to the dairy question, because I don't know whether people saw this in Seattle, but there was an editorial or an opinion piece in the Seattle Times by a farmer that's over on the east side of the Cascades by the name of Austin Allred. And he owns a business called Royal Dairy. It's a concentrated lot operation. Um, he, and he essentially says, I'm saving my family farm, and I've got a 10,000 uh, herd dairy farm here. Is this all bad? Right? Because I'm actually trying to compete as a family farmer. Um, so that's, we're going to maybe localize the discussion a little bit. Right? So um, he su supplies all his milk to Dairy Gold. Dairy Gold in the state of Washington has 1,900 employees. They're the CEO has said in Seattle Times that they are targeting 50% of their production to export. Um, that export is primarily going to be, you know, some type of milk products, not, you know, it's going to be dry milk and, and the like, which is going to head into processed food overseas. Um, the workforce is, I'm guessing, 30 employees probably 80 to 90 percent Hispanic. Um, well, how do you change that system? You know, the, you've got 1,900 employees, they're export driven, they have the, the ear of the politicians. The herd overseas is very diverse. It's not concentrated in an individual uh, country. Um, and yet when you criticize the model, um, it comes across as being anti-farmer, right? You say, I'm, why are you against a, a farmer that 
is trying to save his family business, that's trying to promote trade, that's trying to add jobs. You know, it's a very complicated system. I don't know, maybe you, know, maybe you just comment a little bit on that because I don't see a way that you can change the system when there's so many things going on simultaneously. It is a big problem. I mean, you're right, it's a complex problem. Um, I would say that this idea of looking at what Canada is doing is something that's being advanced by the Wisconsin Farmers Union. They have a group called Dairy Together where they bring dairy farmers from all across the country. They've been doing speaking tours. They have hired agricultural economists to figure out a system like that that might work in the United States. Um, and it would, and I think part of their conclusion is you couldn't have, the U.S. is so much bigger than Canada in terms of production. You probably wouldn't have one system for the entire country, but a system of coordinated regional systems. So all of this is to say is there are farmer-led campaigns on, the, on this notion moving forward. Um, and, and a lot of what they would say is, I mean, I don't know that they, they even say something about the size of the farm. You know, I, I think um, how you define a family farm is, is a hard thing to know. Um, it's a complicated thing. However, I think we can look toward farmer-led solutions, for, you know, coming from dairy farmers to think about how we could get to a better transition that prioritizes producing what we need in the United States rather than assuming that we need to export a lot of, most of that milk is going to be going to Mexico, um, where it's already driven a lot of Mexican dairy farmers out. And that is our biggest uh, export market for milk products. Not to say we don't export, but like in the Canadian case, they export a little, but mostly just what's left over, like with around, you know, when things don't quite work out with their projections, not the thing that's driving it. I'll just say that we're a member of National Family Farm Coalition, which um, is, like, has to prioritize this Dairy Together campaign, and we haven't had the resources locally to, to to analyze the Washington State dairy um, sector. And it's just, I mean, it's really, I appreciate you bringing in the local angle, and we would love to work with folks who, you know, want to think about how we advocate around that locally, because we just, yeah, we have two staff and lots of volunteers and would love help thinking about Washington State specifically around that. Um, Chris, do you have your hand up too? Well, I think about the, 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 the presentation, the movie part of the, with the, the course, concentration and consolidation of corporations, okay? And then also in the trade realm, same thing. Big, few, very concentrated. And she went through a bunch of areas where it's very concentrated. So we've got, we've got a huge system here that some of us call capitalism, um, which includes something similar to what the healthcare discussion folks are saying the insurance industry does. It sucks out huge amount of money. Not giving health. Sucks out huge amount of money. So to me, we also have to start to look at agriculture in the same way. The structure of it, the role of the corporations, there are size differences all along the way from small to medium to whatever. And they change. The nature of what they're after and what they do, those, in, in, those enterprises changes so as they get larger. Okay, So this is a huge discussion of how to you know, work on it, to reform it from techniques to improve the soil to taking out this extraction of wealth that's driving the huge pieces at the top. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things I remember when I was young that I have not seen go on for quite a while, and I would imagine some globalization has something to do with it, but when I was young, I remember with dairy um, that the government would buy excess amounts of milk from the dairy farmers, and they would have, and they would make cheese out of it, and then they would give it the, the cheese to the food bank programs and to, the, uh, to help people of less advantage. Um, to me, it's uh, 
you don't see much of that help your fellow man uh, things going on anymore. It's all about making a profit. <laughs> you know, I just want to add briefly before we move on to others that that program started out, I think, with really good intentions and ended up becoming very inefficient and being used in food aid overseas. And for many years, when I was, well, when I started working on the agriculture specifically, maybe 10 years ago, people would laugh you out of the room if you talked about supply management because they'd say, yeah, we did that and it didn't work. And what I think is interesting now, looking at the example of the Canadian system, um, I would say Indonesia's rice system, there's a few examples around the world of countries that are doing things differently. You know, so the concept itself isn't what's wrong. There were mistakes, uh, and we can do things differently. So you're keeping track, right? Yeah. Then. Um, there, there seems to be a lot of focus on those five big crops that you identified. Your your slide that showed the um, the, the dumping at uh, below production cost uh, rates overseas. And I was I was wondering to what extent we could um, get away from some of the, the problems that you've identified by trying to de-emphasize those big five crops. Again, you know, that, that's kind of where the, the major corporations are playing. And instead, put more emphasis on, you know, a wide variety of, of food <coughs> crops that lend themselves more to smaller operations. Because it, the... Everything about the, the WTO when I first started getting informed about this, it, it seemed to me that, that the whole term fair trade had been co-opted, that it was really corporate managed trade for the benefit of corporations. And in, in terms of agriculture, the, you know, all, any provisions concerning um, agriculture and trade, you know, it, it's all going to be it seems like focused on these major crops where the big corporations play. So how, how to kind of move away from that and, and emphasize at least domestically uh, in our agricultural policies the, the production of, of you know, food crops other than those big five commodities. I think the, the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition has a lot of really good legislative proposals on the Farm Bill. And one of the centerpieces, one part I really like, is shifting, and of course you wouldn't want to do this overnight, right, but shifting more support into the conservation stewardship program. That gives farmers a range of options of sustainable practices, mulching, different things that they might do. The farmer decides what makes sense for him or her, uh, and then can get support based on that. It is minuscule in the Farm Bill. That kind of program then lets farmers decide what they should be producing, you know, and gives them support to transition to more sustainable production rather than locking them in to this other production. I think, to me, that is a really hopeful sign. Um, it's, you know, it was almost eliminated in the last Farm Bill, um, but I think that's the kind of thing we should be thinking more about. Well, when, when does the next Farm Bill come up? Um, it's every five years, sort so of. Five years from last, four years from now. Okay. okay. Yeah. So who is fighting for um, seed, seed saving for farmers? Uh, La Vie Campesina, certainly. Mm -hmm. All those networks. I mean, the African farmers we work with, that's a I major mean, focus. In the United States, even. They, yeah. They've been wanting to do seed saving, and, and every time they try, they get sued. Um, you had your hand up, and then... Um, okay. You can go ahead if you want. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so a couple questions. Uh, back when this, this country cared about farmers, uh, we created the Grange. If we're looking at a Green New Deal, we really need to relook at the Grange. And uh, I think that when we went into Afghanistan and Iraq, the first thing we did was destroy their seed libraries. That was not an accident. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I need to know what legislation is coming up around the world about Monsanto's power to genetically modify and lock out farmers from their seed crop. Um, because that's, you know, that's the ultimate control right there. And they're doing it with medicinal plants also. 
and they'll just change the plant base slightly, genetically, and then patent it. And Terminator technology has driven farmers of cotton in India to <coughs> self-emulate because they can't uh, continue with their uh, production, traditional production. So I was wondering what you think about can Grange, if we modify the Grange. We used to have uh, co-op banks also for food co-ops and, and domestic production. There used to be co-op banks in this country. Have they disappeared completely? Do you know? I don't know the full answer to that, but I will say uh, NAFTA, the new NAFTA, yeah. requires uh, Mexico to ratify a treaty called UPAW, which is on uh, protection of plant varieties, um, a version that will not allow, prohibits farmers from saving and sharing protected oh. seeds. So this is something that would change. Um, now, in fact, Mexico has already agreed to do that under the TPP, yeah. but it's pretty unlikely, I think, that you know Chile is going to force them to comply, yeah. like other TPP members. Um, but that is something I think that is a risk, and it shows one sort of the overreach of these trade agreements. That kind of thing really doesn't need to be in the trade agreement. Okay. How many? Five. Five. I just say UPAV is also something that that our partners. Um, so we have a campaign called Agri Watch which was founded many years ago um, when the Gates Foundation started uh, their agricultural development work in Africa. And it's called AgriWatch because Agra is the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, but they actually do that work through lots of different programs. Um, but we had already named it. But um, So I mean, we invite you to join us in that campaign and in putting pressure on the Gates Foundation. Um, we're going to be publishing a report soon about the Cornell Alliance for Science, which they fund, which is uh, to fund propaganda, basically, and press, um, pressure governments to pass these new laws, which, you know, they Af most African countries, I mean, uh, haven't approved the um, production or sale of GMOs up to this point. Not that GMOs are the only problem at all with, with what they're pushing there. Um, but... Um, yeah, it's, I mean, that's what Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, one of the main things that they highlight is, is the importance of seed sovereignty and seed saving. And there's lots of beautiful examples of farmers doing that work and training thousands of farmers in doing that work. And, you know, it's just insane that that, that is like actually being criminalized. I mean, it's, right? I, it's yeah, it's just outrageous. Um, one person who's, you know, very well known in speaking out about that historically, of course, is Vandana Shiva, who sent a video greeting, who, you know, I think was, I remember hearing her speak in Seattle when she was here in 1999, and she's continued to really be one of the, probably the most well-known advocate for seed sovereignty. And she's being very outspoken about the Gates Foundation um, and proposing an international campaign and just published a new book. So excited to be collaborating potentially more with her. Um, and I. I'm hoping we can bring her back to Seattle um, next year. But. Can I just make a little quick, quick comment on that last piece? Sure. Uh, to, 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 sorry, to tie it into the, the presentation on mm -hmm. the dumping uh, dumping slide that you, you look, uh, displayed, uh, that the, that the Mon Monsanto and, and those seed folks uh, put forth essentially what I say is a lie, which is that um, we need to produce more food. You just showed yeah. we're over overproducing yeah. for 30 years. Yeah. Their lie sells. We need to produce more, therefore we need genetic engineering. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nonsense. Mm -hmm. just well, one more quick comment, and then my little we're actually going to ask you to comment at the, at the end about alternatives. We need to wrap up soon. But, um, so we have the, one of the biggest proponents of this kind of damage a mile away from here, and yeah. we're not in front of his foundation ever oh, yes, protesting. Oh, yes, we are. We are. We are. We are. But please join us. Yes, we just had one two weeks ago or a month ago, whatever. With, I didn't even know. With that. the coordinator of Alliance of Food Sovereignty in Africa was here and, you know, spoke out against the Gates Foundation in front of the Gates Foundation and then spoke on this very stage. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Argo Watch is trying to do that work, but we need to do it more often and we need to have bigger, you know, yeah. more people. Because he is because in the name of philanthropy, 
Yeah. He's destroying yes. a whole continent. Yes. And other places too. Mm -hmm. No, regarding what you said about that it is a lie that we need to produce more food, um, that's where I think it's important also to distinguish food sovereignty with food security because sometimes they use food security in different countries to sustain that lie. You know? right. Food security is more, I mean, Monsanto and all the agro industrial companies use food security, and yeah. so that's why food sovereignty is so different and so important. Um, they don't talk about poverty. Yes. And they use, sure, they use Malthusian theories of yeah. overpopulation and so on. So. And on the alternatives, well, I just want to say that Karen and other people from Mexico contributed to that document that I've been talking about, beyond NAFTA 2.0, with a chapter on agriculture, where there's a very detailed analysis on the new NAFTA um, and also what the alternatives that people like IT people, many others like that campesina, etc. are putting forward. We do. We are over time, but this has been a great discussion. Thank you. Yeah, and if um, you. you're not already signed up to CAGJ, we have our annual report here. Please sign up and we'll send you an email just once a month with our, with our monthly newsletter and really invite folks to get involved in these issues locally. We support local food justice campaigns, including the farm workers in Skagit County, the organize an independent union. We work in solidarity with the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project against genetically engineered salmon and amplifying how Northwest tribes are opposing GE salmon. We are in solidarity with the UFCW and grocery workers and with Got Green, so we support all those campaigns. Plus, we have our AgriWatch campaign focused on the Gates Foundation, and we try to educate about the impact of trade agreements on our food system. So lots of different areas of work, lots of ways to get involved. Thank you so much, Karen and Manuel and everybody for joining us for this workshop. So please do look at our website, too, um, for a lot more of this information. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you upstairs.